We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, and this is episode two of the Thrift Diving Podcast. Today, we are tackling a huge problem that we creative people experience all the time. How do we actually complete our projects? So today I'm talking to Charles Gilkey. He's the author of several books, but the one that landed in my mailbox is called Start Finishing. And it's about helping creative people finish their projects. And he's going to give us some tips on how many projects are too many. How do you structure your time so that you get all of these things done that you want to get done without overwhelming yourself. So we're going to jump into that conversation today. Keep listening. It's a long conversation, but I think you're going to find a lot of value. And he actually coined a term, creative constipation. And I know you're curious about what that means. (laughs) Keep listening because we're going to talk about it right now. Here's our conversation with Charles Gilkey. He's a CEO and founder of Productive Flourishing. He's a former army officer, philosopher, and a business and executive coach. And he's a speaker who helps professional creatives, leaders, and change makers to take meaningful action on the work that matters. And we're going to talk a lot about that. He's the author of a book that I was so excited to receive in the mail. It's called Start Finishing, How to Go from Idea to Done. And this is a nine-step method for helping people to identify their best work and find supporters of that work and navigate multiple projects, because that's what we do as creative people, and overcome those challenges. And he also wrote another book in 2012 called The Small Business Life Cycle. And you can find him over on his podcast, The Productive Flourishing Podcast, where he will dive behind the scenes to talk to people and find out how to thrive as a creative person who's actually making a difference in the world. He lives in Portland, Oregon with his wife, and I am so happy to welcome Charles Gilkey. I don't have any applause, so I will applause. (laughs) I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. So I was explaining earlier before we started, uh, before we really started to get in here, that when I first heard about your book, I had to talk to you because I know that there's a lot of productivity books out there. And you know, this thrift diving is not really a productivity channel or podcast. But a lot of what we do is about being productive when we're doing projects, DIY projects. And there was something different about your book where you specifically were talking about creative people. I'd never heard anybody in a productivity book, talk about creatives. And I thought, oh my gosh, this book is for me and my audience. So I I wanted to know, tell me why you framed your book in this kind of way where you're specifically talking to creative people, but it's really a book that could be applicable to any niche, but you focused on creative people. Why, Why creative people? Well, I think creative people have some unique challenges. And one of those unique challenges is too many ideas, not enough time. And so there are some people who I, we don't understand it as much and I'm not trying to make them less than, but like they're good with getting up, going to work, kind of doing work and then going home and not really necessarily being as exasperated and creatively constipated as we can be as creative folks. I love that and term, so, creatively constipated. <laughs> and so when I started thinking about, you know, what to write the book for and who my audience is for, it's for those of us who just really do show up. I was joking when I was giving a book talk about that. It's like, before we have coffee, we already have seven ideas. And then we get the coffee and then it's up to 32. And we haven't even started anything for the day, right? right? Right. Um, And so that leads into all sorts of challenges for us. One of which is we start a lot of things, but don't finish it um, or don't finish those things. And that can lead to um, what I mentioned, creative constipation. At a certain point, we start um, getting super toxic and destroying ourselves in a way because as creative people, we're either creating or we're destroying. Yep. And if you're not putting out that work, if you're not doing the creative stuff that really makes you come alive, you'll start destroying the things around you, your relationships, your resources, and yes. finally the stories that you tell yourself about yourself. Yes. And so that's really what I wanted to say. It's like, yo, we've got a problem here. And the way we need to go about doing it is diff- or solving that problem is different than if we were, say, a manager at a Fortune 500 company that's got Mm -hmm. a lot of incoming and playing rebound. I'm not trying to say managers can't be creative, but it's a different context. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that I like in your book that you talked about is it's not, and I can't quote you here, but you talked about the difference between an idea and a project. And you said Mm -hmm. everything is a project. Because in my mind as a DIYer, I think, well, a project is when I'm painting a piece of furniture, I'm building something, that's a project. 
And I'm not thinking of all the other things that I do as projects, but it's all projects. So how did you come up with that understanding that really everything we do is a project? Well, it's really one of those things where um, if it takes time, energy, and attention, it's a project, right? Ideas don't take time, energy, and attention, and we don't do ideas. We do projects. Right. And unfortunately, what I noticed is that we're really inconsistent about how we think about work and projects in the different domains of our life. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times people have these really great skills for getting stuff done when applied to their economic work. So their jobs, their business, you know, anything that pulls in money. But when they look at the work of their lives, the personal work, the creative work, the play work, they don't apply those same skills. They don't apply those same ways of deciding about it. And so what ends up happening is we end up prioritizing, scheduling, and doing the economic work and trying to find space in the leftovers for the work of our lives. And so what I wanted to do is put it all on deck and say, mm -hmm. look, it's all projects. Now, which of those projects do you need to do to build the bridge to the life you want to be in. Because there are some projects that do that and others that don't. And if you're continually doing work that's not pushing you towards the life you want to live and the work you want to do, then it's time to pick some different projects because that's what projects will do for you. So you, in the book, you describe that as like your best work, right? Mm -hmm. Like those projects that, when I think of my best work, I think of projects where it doesn't even matter how long I've been doing it. I feel energized when I do it. I'm excited about it. I can't wait to tell people, look what I did. And sometimes we don't get that time to do that. In fact, I'll tell you a little story. I started working with a business manager. He's part of my family. And we sat down. He said, what are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals? So we came up with those. And then he said, okay, now we have to schedule it. I'm like, um... Okay. <laughs> and so he held me to that. And you talk about that in your book. If there's things that you want to do that's part of your best work, those things that make you feel alive, you have to schedule them. But I find that to be very hard. So how do, how do you help people overcome that, that roadblock of being able to put their best work on their schedule? How do you do that? So first off, let's talk about what it is about our best work that makes it harder than some of the other work, right? And unfortunately, the more something matters to you, the more you'll thrash with it. And thrashing is that sort of emotional meta work, the research, all the sort of flailing you'll do around the project that actually doesn't push the project forward. Mm. And we do that with our best work because it really matters to us. Like we don't have a, you know, a big story about taking out the trash or doing the laundry. We either do it or we don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a story about taking the trash. It doesn't matter that much. But there are some types of work that we have so closely tied to our identity that its success or failure really does matter to us. And so mm -hmm. if we try something and it doesn't work, who are we? What does that say about myself? You've been telling yourself for years you're going to write a book or you're going to build a couch or you're going to do those types of things. And then if you do it and you don't know how to do it, or it turns out like crap, like who are you as a person? Yes. And so it matters so much more to us. And so there's this sort of paradox here. We most want to do it at the same time that it's the thing that scares us the most. Yes. Right. Um, and so that's sort of the place where we get stuck. Now, I'm going to pause here. Because it's not just the fear of failure that gets us stuck with our best work. It's actually the fear of success as well. Um, because mm -hmm. we have to tell, we tell ourselves all sorts of no-win scenarios about winning. So there are four general types. Mm -hmm. One is um, success will wreck my relationships. So if you really dive into it and it blows up on you and you really love it, that there's going to be people around you that get mad at you. Maybe you won't be the partner or the parent or the son right. or the daughter or the friend that you used to be. Right. And we don't want to give that up. So that's one. Two is... Um, there's, you know, success versus virtue or success versus integrity. Like we have so many stories about nice guys finishing last and rich people being scumbags mm -hmm. and, you know, real artists not being able to make money. So like we think that if we end up in a position where we're being successful with something that we've done so at the cost of our integrity and character. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to do that. The third is what if we set us so high of a bar for ourselves that we can't do it again? And that's a fall. That's like really a far fall from where we were back down to the bottom. Maybe we were right. just lucky. And then the fourth one is success will come at the cost of our health through burnout, through mental suffering, through different types of things. And so what we do is, you know, the more we can get immersed in our best work and it sort of consumes us in that way, 
the more we start to worry about the downsides of success. Mm -hmm. And we pull back and we go for this gray mediocrity that's neither winning nor failing because we don't want to fail. That's that's normal. But we also don't want to succeed because we don't want to be bitten by all the dragons that come with success. So we just shoot for the middle. And so we end up emotionally stuck in that way. And what about those people who are like, you mentioned it in your book about the naysayers. And I have, and I just have to admit, I've got a naysayer who lives in my home called husband. And a lot of times he is the naysayer whenever I want to do a, a DIY project, especially one that goes outside of what I've never done before, which I would really say is my best work. You know, it's challenging myself. He's the one who will tell me that's not going to work. Why don't you hire someone? You don't know how to do that. He's laughed at me when I've said I wanted to do certain things. So how do we go about getting somebody who, especially as someone that's our spouse or best friend, who's living with us or close to us to understand what our best work is and to, to support us and not just kick us down because this is what we're trying to do. So I've got good news and bad news for you. <laughs> Let's do the good news first. <laughs> The good news is your easiest strategy is actually to avoid talking about your projects with them. Really? Right. That's so hard to yeah. do, especially at home. You're excited about it. You're like, hey, look what I am trying to do. And they're like, yeah, that's not going to work. Mm, All right. So it might be that he's actually more of a derailer than a naysayer. Right. Okay. And I would put him in the derailer category because he actually does love you and does want you to be successful and happy. It's just your approach or his approach to helping you is not helpful, right? Okay. And so it's not yes, a, I'd, I'd it's not, there. not quite a naysayers in the sense of naysayers are much more on the haters going to hate side of things, okay. right? <laughs> Where they're just going to shoot you down because they don't like you or they don't like the work or they've got a personal right. vendetta to be, you know, the arbiter of things that should be done and should not be done, mm -hmm. right? So I don't think your husband's a naysayer. I actually think he's a derailer, right? Um, the strategies are mostly the same though, right? Um, because it kind of goes to, well, I do talk about some different strategies in the book, but part of it is thinking about, okay, communicating with him that there may be ways in which you need to be communicated with that are more supportive mm -hmm. um, and to agree, like, do you want me to be happy? Do you want me to be successful? Do you want me to have some creative joy in my life? Do you want this yes. house to look amazing? Do you want this house to look amazing? <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. So we agree on those goals. Yes. Now, how we're communicating about this needs to change, right? Because we're not in alignment on that side of things. And so there are different ways that you can request communication changes. It's like, you know what? Maybe before you start shooting it down, maybe you give me three reasons of why it can work or three things you like about it first, mm -hmm. right? So I at least get some positive feedback and you don't just seem to be the voice of no every time I want to do right. something because that creates unnecessary tension. So you have to be really clear about requesting specific types of behavior um, and then sort of holding it to that. Now, if they won't follow that, then that's where you start avoiding it. And it kind of goes to um, this sort of scorpion frog story. So I'll just say it real, I could be really brief about this. Sure. But, um, so it's a parable, obviously. So a scorpion sitting on the side of the lake. He sees frog and he wants to go across the lake. Um, and so scorpion's like, hey, frog please take me across the lake. I need to get on the other side. And frog's like, I'm not taking you across the lake. You're going to sting me. It's not a good idea. No, I'm not going to do it. So scorpion finally convinces and, you know, argues and finally frog relents. And he's like, fine, come on. I'll take you across the lake. Halfway across the lake, scorpion stings frog. Boom. And as they're both drowning, frog looks at scorpion and says, why did you sting me? And scorpion goes, I'm a, I'm a scorpion. It's in my nature to sting. <laughs> okay. So I'm an eternal optimist for changing people. Mm -hmm. I just don't know when people are going to change. Right. And their rate of change might not match your need for change. And so in this case, I just have to say, like, if you've got a naysayer or you've got a derailer, you might have that sort of scorpion thing. Don't be the frog. Right. Right. And so that's the very best thing you can do in this scenario, because expecting other people to change so that you can do the work that you need to do. Um, is a very contentious and long and hard way to do the work you most want to mm -hmm. do. And so, yes, I know it might be hard not to be excited with him, but um, at this point in your communication patterns and behaviors, he's not the right venue. He's not the right cheerleader and yaysayer for you. And so that might be where you have a friend that you call at the end of the day and you guys have a cheerleading pact where it's like whenever you have a good idea, you call him or her and like, hey, I got an idea. And, they're like, yes. awesome. right? and they go, they do all that kind of whatnot. And you get that need to socially process your excitement out of you. 
but it doesn't have to be held by the partner in your house that right. creates a, the unnecessary tension. I like that. No, I, I think, you know, one thing that we've done with thrift diving is we've built this community of people who are those cheerleaders. So for example, we do something probably a few times every year, we do something called 30 day room makeover challenges and mm -hmm. we actually do it all together. So we say, Hey, we're going to pick one room in our house. We're going to declutter, decorate, whatever we need to do. But we have 30 days, we have that timeline. And then we've got a Facebook group where we actually pull everybody together. We're posting process pictures. And I would think this is what you call your success pack. Is that what you mm -hmm. call a success pack? Because we have this community of people who are the cheerleaders. So is that what your, your success pack is and how you think of it in your book? It can be. Um, what I would say is, so your success pack is that group of yaysayers that you put around your projects and more um, generally you put around your life. And it consists of four different kinds of yaysayers. So there are guides, which are your Yodas, Dumbledores, you know, Gandalfs that sort of guide you on the path, but they're not involved in the project with you. And your guides give you eyes in that they see the world differently than you do. And they can help show you what's actually there that you often can't see yourself. Mm -hmm. Two are the second group is your um, peers and your peers are the people that are sort of shoulder to shoulder with you um, that may advise on the project, may not have the level of vision that your guides do, but they're the phone of friends that you can call like, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you help me out? Have you tried this before? Mm -hmm. So, so your, um, your, your peers give you their brains, right? Your supporters give you hands. They're the people in the project with you doing stuff, moving stuff around with you. And lastly, the beneficiaries are the people who give you the heart of the project because they're the people who will benefit from the mm. project and will keep you in it. And so um, I encourage people to put three to five people in each category okay. um, around a certain project. And so, yes, you might have in that group. You might have a combination of peers and supporters, depending upon what they're doing. You might also have beneficiaries because if they're seeing the cool stuff you're making and they're loving it and they're getting those delights and they're getting inspiration, then it might inspire them to do something on their own. So I think you can have all three in that group, mm -hmm. but I just want people to be specific about what role they're playing um, on that project so that um, they can drive forward. And I'll pause here because when I talk about this, most people's first thought is how do I get more guides? Because they have all the resources, they have the people, they have the money, they have the vision. And I want people to be thinking, how can I get in closer relationship with my beneficiaries? Mm -hmm. Because your beneficiaries are actually the ones that are going to keep you in the project yes. in two ways. One, when you're cognitively stuck and you don't know where to build X or Y and you don't know what to do, you can like go to the people you're building it for and say, which of these do you like better? Which one solves your problem? Or which one um, would you want me to build? Super easy to do, simple to do, not easy, simple to do. When you're emotionally stuck, they're the people that will keep you back in the project because if you know that if you don't finish that project, they're worse off in a way. They didn't get the delight you were trying to build or they didn't get the solution you were trying to solve for. And so both of those are super critical. So again, don't think about the sage on the hill and what, what they have because they're going to tell you something like be yourself, do what you love. They're going to say something that, that sounds like a fortune cookie mm -hmm. statement. That ends up being very true and useful, but it's your beneficiaries that are going to be the ones that are most likely to keep you in the project and help you get through some of the worst parts of it. And, you know, when I think of doing projects around the home and sometimes you might be doing projects for kids, you're doing projects for your living room, the beneficiary really is your family. You know, you're creating this amazing, beautiful home that if you've got young kids or maybe your kids are gone, but you've got grandkids coming, whoever, or just yourself, you could be living by yourself. You're creating this oasis. And so you are your beneficiary because you're getting to walk home or walk into the door every day and see this beautiful home. And uh, yeah, I just think it's, I think it's great what you've, what you've done. One thing that really interests me, and I just had to laugh a little bit because you have this rule. It's called the five project rule. You have to explain this because as creatives, you know how easy it is to take on multiple projects. You wouldn't believe how many people, you know, my, my audience, we love thrift stores. We love buying things from thrift stores and roadside. We, we rescue things and it's not uncommon to find a stack of furniture in the garage. Now I've learned I don't stack furniture at all, but that's what we do. We have all these projects. How do you go about choosing which projects, how many projects, and, and navigating what to direct your attention on. Great. So the long way of saying the five projects rule 
is no more than five active projects per time perspective. And so I'll start at the end because it makes more sense. Um, I think we all intuitively know the difference between a chunk of work that we can do in two hours versus a project that's going to take us a week. So like a week sized project versus a month sized project versus a quarter sized project. Right. What if we can interrupt real quick? What if we don't know? What if we, we think that we could get a project done in a week, but it's turning into a month long project. So I'm going to pause there because I think what we do is when we think about a specific project, we think about it in isolation from everything else we've got going on. So it might be true that putting together that chair would take you a week if you just focused entirely that week on that chair. However, you might have six other chairs and doodads that you're working on, right, that you're not (laughs) committing to just that. And so I think I think even though we might see that something is taking longer, And, you know, the thing is with DIY, most creative projects, like there's a certain um, length of time we think it's going to take. And then there's a certain amount of time that it's going to take. And it tends to be a factor of three for a lot of us. Like it takes three times as long to do it. But I would still say that, like, I think most people when they're planning is, well, here's what I'll say on this. The less often you do something, the more likely your estimate is going to be off. Right. If you've never rehabbed a chair before, it's going to take you longer than you think. Right. And yep, so definitely. that's a, that's a general rule that I tell people. If it's a new thing, um, think how long you think it should take and then just multiply by three. You're probably <laughs> going to be right. And, yep. you know, um, and so um, that would be the first thing I say. So, again, when we're not doing our projects enough and when we're not building that competency of doing them enough, we actually fall out of practice. And that's one of the reasons projects take longer. Because we might pick up that chair and rehab a chair and then not do another chair for another nine months and have to refigure it out all out. Whereas if we just made, right. you know, a chair a month for nine months, we'd get pretty fast at doing that and we'd be able to estimate better. Right. So I will admit that our planning factors are still off, right, or can be off. And I think it's still true, maybe not for the two hour thing, because I think we can get super confused about that. But I think we still know the difference between a week long project or a project we think should take a week and a project we think should take a month to do. Right. And Mm -hmm. so an example here, and I'll stick with chairs and tables, because that's about as far as making goes for me. Right. (laughs) Like we know that making a full set of table and four chairs, that's probably if you focus on it and you just stick with it, that's probably a month sized project. Right. Yep. Um, whereas making one chair might be a week size project, depending upon what it is. And so we kind of can know that difference between the two. And that's where the five project rule starts to kick in. Because when you're thinking about what I'm going to do for this month, you don't have to think about all of the things at once. You can think in terms of month sized projects and say, okay, one of the projects I want to do this month is to finish that table set. Okay, one project down, Mm -hmm. right? I also have some projects from work that you can either think of those projects individually or you can say, you know what, I work full time. I'm not going to think too much about that. I know that three of my project slots are taken from work. Okay, so now I'm up to four. And then that leaves you one other thing to do. Remember, anything that takes time, energy, and attention is a project. So getting married, getting divorced, getting the kids off the couch, you know, dating, all of those types of things can count as projects. You know, if you need to really kick off a new exercise routine, you're having a diet or you want to go on that trip to Spain, all of those are projects. And so it might be like, okay, I got my work projects. I'm going to finish the table set and I'm going to go to Spain for a week. That's, that's really the simplicity of the rule. And you don't necessarily at that point in time have to go down and start thinking like each week, what am I going to do? Because then when you're thinking about what you need to do this week and say, okay, what were my five projects for the month? Mm -hmm. helps you to focus. Yeah. So if those are my five projects for this month, this week, what are the week size chunks that I can do to push those projects forward? And then you sort of do that same process. And the challenge that so many people will face with this is like, it's not a conceptually hard thing to do. It's emotionally hard Mm. because you have to decide at the beginning what you're not going to do. Yes. You talked Um, a little bit about discipline. And so you said that Knowing what to work on and what not to work on is really about discipline. Yeah. Can you talk more about that discipline? Yeah. Well, I lack so, that. I lack that a lot. <laughs> here's the thing. Here's what I'll say on this one. The reality is if you commit to 17 projects, you're going to do 
three to five of those projects. That's why it's the five projects rules, because doing this, you know, for a decade and some change and doing a lot of research on this, most of us don't do more than five significant projects at different time horizons. A good week where we get five significant projects done, and that's like a win week, right, for most of us, right? So right. we're not going to do more than that anyways. Latching on to 19 different projects that you're thinking about doing, it's just going to give you more fodder to beat yourself up on the backside. Yes. More regret, more frustration, more cognitive and emotional labor that you put on stuff that's not going forward. So that pain is going to be somewhere around the project, somewhere around the idea. So my suggestion is that we put the pain up front. And then when we make progress on it in the week, we're like, you know what? Yeah, I wasn't able to do all those other things, but I got that done. Yes. I built the chair. Yes. And there's a chair where there used to be wood or there's a <laughs> chair that I can sit on where there used to be some janky thing that I got from the thrift store, right? But how do you move forward? For example, when you first start a project, I know for myself, I'm super excited about it. I keep working on it. And then towards the end, uh, like a good example, I put some new vinyl flooring. This is my basement office. Put some new vinyl flooring. It looked great. I ran into a problem with water still coming into the basement, so I had to take up a few of the tiles. It's been, Charles, 10 months, and there are still tiles laying over here. There's just a bare spot. And I have not been able to bring myself to stop working on other things and go finish that. So how do you get through that last 10% of really finishing, putting the baseboards on, you know, saying, okay, stamp of approval, this is done. How do you get through that that last 10%. So the five projects rule can help if you follow it, because if you, we were being disciplined with it, it goes back to that. And you say, you know what? I can't take on a new project until I finish the floor. Mm. Right. Um, but you've gone through the fun part of the project and you've just got that little leftover over there, probably in a corner that there's no pain. There's no real pain about there's that not. corner being right. And so it really isn't. But Sometimes feel, I don't even notice that it's there. I just walk by and I'm like, Oh, look at those tiles that's been sitting there for 10 months. Yeah, that's the difficult part. Where there's no pain, you're going to be challenged because the projects that are right in front of you, the joy of doing those, you feel some pain if you don't get to do those, right? And so mm -hmm. that's, we have to reallocate some of the pain to be um, so that, you know, either one, one hack here, and people won't like this one, but is to rearrange your office so that it does annoy you enough to finish it. Oh, I like that. Like where I have uh, to angle my desk so I have to look over there and see that this spot is or invite people over. I think one of the biggest things to get people motivated, especially with doing projects in the home, not wanting that sense of embarrassment is knowing that there's people coming over, especially during holidays, birthday parties, you know, when there's this external force that, oh my gosh, I'm going to be mortified if someone sees that my floor is jacked up. I need to get yeah. that done. So is there a way that we could inject some sort of external things like that so that we we can have that moment. Absolutely. I call them catalytic moments, right? Catalytic <laughs> moments are what we have to do. So um, I'm a public speaker and I'm also a creative person and I'll sit on an idea for three years before I do anything with it. But I know that if I actually want to get it out, sometimes I just have to schedule a speech or a talk where I have to talk about that thing. Mm. Right. Because I'm not going to show up and be like, I don't know what I'm talking about. And it's like it's going to force the compression and make me squeeze it right. out. And so it's a catalytic moment. So in your case, having people over would be a catalytic moment. You know, another thing you can do is you can recruit your success pack here. Right. The challenge that you have probably with the tile thing is that it had a beneficiary of one, which is you. Yes. Right. You're at a point with the project where you're actually OK with it being undone. <laughs> Um, Don't say that. I never want to admit that's the truth. My husband doesn't like that. He's like, when are you going to finish this floor? I'm like, I'm going to get to it. <laughs> yeah, but we have different tools that we can use for you. So for instance, you have a community. So imagine that you say, look, guys, I'm going to finish this by October the 31st. I'm going to publicly commit to doing it. And I have to show you a picture on October 31st of whatever state that it's in. For some people, that would be enough. Like, I can't just like renege on it. I can't show up and be the DIY person exactly. that can't finish the project, right? Yes, and yes. so we do actually have to induce some, for lack of better words, pain or some frustration. Otherwise, the things that are right in front of you that sound super fun 
that sound like that puzzle that you just want to solve, you're going to go there because that's where the ice cream is. Mm -hmm. right? um, there's no longer any ice cream in, in the tile project, right? And so you're always sort of looking between this last bit that I don't want to do, I don't really care, versus get some more ice cream. Exactly. Right? And so how do we change that balance such that it's you have to eat the broccoli, as it were? And so I think that's sort of the challenge. And that's why I think it's a good idea for you no longer to stack furniture and things like that, because it allows you to put stuff away where you don't see it. Right, right. And then that creates a sort of thing out of sight, out of mind. Um, and it and creates a lot of anxiety too, you know, just yeah. knowing that, I mean, when you do go into that garage or to that spare room where things are stacked up, it creates this anxiety of, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. I have too much stuff and I don't know where to start. I don't know which one to start on. Yeah, you've seen it. I've seen it. People will avoid entire sections of their house that they've got cluttered with stuff. They just right. don't even want to go there because they just know that it's there. And my point is that emotional drain has a real cost, right? Because that's energy that's sapping other parts of your life. That yes. energy of avoidance is tied to, um, you know, the creative constipation. But once you start pushing some of those projects and you get inspired and you get some momentum on your side. Yeah, right? it feels really and, good when and, you start tackling those things. And, and yeah. when you tell yourself, you know what? It's okay. I don't have to do all that. Like you said, I'm picking these five that I'm going to focus on. But I like that when you talk about the five projects, that they don't have to be like five different chairs. The fact that you started a health program, like for example, me, I've started running again every morning, three miles. It really has been my project. I'm tracking what I eat, just trying to make better choices and get enough vitamins and nutrients. So the way you explain it, I see that that is a project that I took on. And I didn't realize that that was a project. I wasn't calling it that. But, you know, that is taking my time and attention and focus. And now I, I've got four other projects that I can focus on. So five is the max, right? So you don't have to accept five every month or quarter, or whatever. Can you just focus on one? Do you see yeah. people often just focus on one project? Yeah, so it's no more than five, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so absolutely, you can focus on one, you can focus on two. And what I tend to encourage people to do, especially if you have a job, is to think like three work projects and two life projects, mm -hmm. just looking at how much time and attention a full-time job can take from you, right? Mm -hmm. And at work, you can figure out what your three projects are at work. And just as a sidebar, if you want to get ahead at work, having the discipline to pick three significant projects that align with your boss's priorities and getting them done every week mm. will put you ahead in like three to six months, right? You'll be one of the star performers if you just did that. But back on point here, um, the other thing that I want to add in there is if you're grieving or you're recovering from a car accident or you've got a chronic illness, mm -hmm. you can think about it one of two ways. It either counts as a project or wow. it takes a project slot. Oh, Wow. And because it's taken that time, energy, attention, and life force that you might apply to other things. Right. The reason I say going through a divorce is a project is it might actually be two. Mm -hmm. It might be the logistics of the divorce. Right. But it also might be the grieving and loss and sort of the emotional stuff that happens in a divorce. So it might just be you're getting through that and going to work. And that's life right now. Right. And that's completely okay. Right. You don't have to stack other things on top of that. Um and so, yeah, you absolutely can do it. And you might just go through a period where you recognize either because of where you are emotionally or maybe it's the season of the year. For instance, we're in my ascending season. So mm -hmm. I get super creative in the fall and winter. Mm -hmm. In the summer, I'm not. So in the summer, I snatch a couple of blocks and say, you know, a couple of project slots. You're like, you know what, during the summer quarter. I get like three projects because that's the most that I'm going to do anyways, right? Right. Um, I don't get five. In the, in the winter, I push the limits a bit more, right? Um, and so you don't have to focus on that many. But what you have to look at is when you look at sort of your current life and your current work and your best life and your best work, there's a gap between there. Mm -hmm. And if you're really trying to fill that gap, it takes certain types of projects to do it. Right. If you're okay at a certain point and that's not the focus, or maybe you want to take a break, then absolutely you can focus on fewer projects. And sometimes, again, grieving, injury, illness, you might not have that many to start with. And I'm fortunate, I hate to be the bearer of bad news and bearer of reality in that way. But the best thing we can do is be more compassionate to ourselves mm -hmm. and more realistic about what we're going to be able to do because all of that extra commitment juice that we apply to ideas and projects we're not going to do just rebounds back on us in negative stories about ourselves and frustration and yes. creative constipation. Yes. I think the idea of, of just focusing on those five projects gives you permission to say, 
I'm, I can't take one anymore. These are the only things that I'm going to focus on. And I like that you broke it down three, you know, let's say three work projects and two personal projects. Now, real quick, before we wrap this up, how do people go about scheduling that time? Like you had mentioned, some people know that some things may take two hours, some things may take a week. So number one, knowing that it's going to be a, a larger or smaller project, but how do you actually get that on your schedule and hold yourself accountable to actually doing it? Because that's the hard part too. That's the hard part. In the book, I talk about block planning, which is a different way of thinking about your days and weeks. And so there are four different types of blocks. There are focus blocks, which are 90 to 120 minute blocks of time where you can actually dive into a project and get some things done. So in the DIY context, it might be where you actually get the tools out, you get the materials out, and you're actually going to work on that thing for a little bit. You know that it's super hard to do it in a smaller slice of time because by the time you get everything out, you're putting it back up mm -hmm. um, or you, you know, you hit three strokes on it and you're done. It's like, that's unsatisfying. So focus blocks in the context of what we're talking about are again, 90, 120 minutes at a time where you can just focus on that project. Now, what I will say is during that focus block, you can go to the bathroom, you can get more tea or coffee and things like that, but you're not switching from project or to, you know, you're not bumping from your computer to the chair, to the computer, to the chair and end up right. in that sort of back and forth. So focus blocks one, two are social blocks which are the times in which you're your best version of human and you want to be interacting with people. Mm -hmm. um, those tend to be 90 to 120 minutes long. And again, even though most people schedule meetings for an hour, we know there's 15 minutes of prep on the front side, it tends to be 15 minutes on the back side. And if you're not thinking about that, you'll get to the end of the week and you'll have a slew of emails and slew of notes that you need to take and you can't remember it. So it gets away from you. So again, the general pattern here that I'm encouraging people to do is to put some of that at the beginning of it so you don't have to deal with the pain of it in the backside. Um, third are admin blocks, which are um, 30 minute to an hour long blocks where you just focus on the administrivia. It might be you shopping on Amazon to get your tools or it could be that phone call that you need to make. You know, it could just, be. Could, could that be like just researching the project? Could be. If it's quick research, yes. If it's deep research, that goes in a focus block. Okay. Right. And so like if you're really trying to understand a new blueprint or a new things like that, I would actually probably put that in a um, focus block because otherwise if you take it too quickly – and I've done this before. Right? You're just like, okay, got it. I, I know how to do that. And you jump into it and you're like, wait a second. I don't have the screws and the, and the thing that oh, I yes. need. And then I'm running back and forth to the store, right? So it would have been better if I'd actually printed it out, right? made a list of what I needed – check to make sure that I had what I, what I needed and then jumped into it versus, you know, three trips to the hardware right. store. Um, not that I've ever done that. Um, <laughs> and then the fourth is recovery blocks. So this could be meditation, yoga, running, eating, mm, sleeping, whatever you need to do to recharge your body. Cause the other three kinds of blocks are energy, um, expending blocks. You mm. put out energy Recovery blocks are energy revitalizing or rejuvenating blocks, right? Mm. And so, and how about much time the should we spend on the recovery blocks? It's it's really variable. It depends on what you need to do, right? And so, um, for instance, it could be that you've got a Peloton in your house and you can ride for forty minutes. Mm -hmm. Great, that's it, right? It could be that you need to do twenty minutes of stretching, or maybe you want to roll around with the dogs for fifteen twenty minutes to to refuel your your energy and things like that. Like, I'm it's variable. And I don't really care what it is. Some people go do CrossFit, which for mm -hmm. me would be energy um, expending, but for them it's rejuvenating. Right. So I'm not going to say what it is, but you know what recovers you or what rejuvenates you and you know what doesn't. So the reason I set that up that way is because it's going to come down to how many focus blocks you have per week in the end of the day, right? Because you know that if you've got to make a chair and again, go back to the chair, but it's going to take you maybe three or four focus blocks. You either have that on your schedule or you don't. And if you don't have it on your schedule, you're not going to finish the chair. It's as yes. simple as that. Yes. Right. And so I'm how do that. we, yeah. How do we do it? Well, you look at those, those projects that you decided you were going to do this week and you look at your blocks that you have available and say, okay, I've got this many blocks. How am I going to like invest in those different projects and spend those blocks to get those projects done? Mm -hmm. And if you get to a point to where you're like, honestly, I'm rolling into the week. I either don't have focus blocks because my schedule looks like Swiss cheese or um, they're all taken up. You're not going to work on that project that week. You're just not. Right? I think it's a very realistic way of looking at projects. Let me give you a real life example. Right now I'm working on a total closet makeover. I'm doing built-ins and all of that. And in my mind, it's going to take me a week. 
Well, then I start researching and I'm like, this is not going to take me a week. And I got real about that. I looked at how many days I had, how many blocks of time I could potentially have, and there was no way I was getting it done. So I think if you start strategizing it where you're looking at those blocks of time and if you're like, well, I don't really have any blocks of time this week, you can know up front, look, this chair is not going to get done. Don't fool yourself, baby. It's not going to happen this week. Maybe next week. <laughs> yeah, so and like that's that. okay. And it's okay that it doesn't happen, right? Because you might look at your week and like, oh, I've got PTA this week. And then, you know, I'm picking up my mom from the airport. She's staying over the weekend. And now that's where your focus blocks went. Great. Right. That is in alignment with your priorities and values. Ain't nothing wrong with that, right? right? But to assume you're going to do all that and get to the chair. You know, you're just setting yourself up for failure. And so to the point with your tile over there, like you probably have three or four focus blocks to get that thing done. Yes. Yes. Right. Just guessing about how big it is. And so that's just where I would be saying, hey, Serena, like if it's if you actually are in pain about this, like where are the focus blocks on your schedule and what are you going to decide not to do so that you can finish that up? Exactly. That's the discipline. One thing that I like that you said in your book about closing out a project and doing those after action reports. I used to work at a job where we worked with military personnel who were going back into education. And uh, that's one thing we had to do for all of our projects. We had to do an after action report. And I forgot about that until I read it in your book. So can you talk real briefly about that before we wrap it up and, and what people should do once they are done a project? What are those critical things they have to do to really kind of close this out? After action review is exactly what you're saying is you look back over the project, say, you know, how'd it go? And there are three basic questions you can ask. I give more in the book, but the three basic ones are what went well, what didn't go well, or what was challenging, and what are you going to do differently next time? If you just ask those three questions about all projects, you end up building this efficiency curve where it gets faster and faster to do projects. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be really specific here. Make sure you do them for successful projects, too. A lot of times when projects fall apart, people are like, oh, I got to figure out what happened. And then they'll go through and they'll do the postmortem or the AAR on it. But they don't think like, man, that was a great project. What did we do that made it that way? Right. Exactly. And so what we end up doing is so focusing on projects that don't work and not building the efficiency and strength around the things that we've done that make projects work. And it ends up upside down. So Mm -hmm. it's just a way of looking at it. And honestly, you could finish the chair, take three minutes, say, okay, what did I learn from this one? What worked? What didn't work? And oh, it turns out that like I was using this type of drill. But if I would have had this other drill, mm. it would have made my life so much easier because I, like I would have been able to get it. And so, you know, next time you want to do a chair project, part of that chair project might be buying the drill that you need so that it doesn't take you so dang long to get it done. Right. Now, do you have worksheets on your website, startfinishingbook.com, where people could actually download some of these so when they're working on projects, they can plan it better? Where can people find you? All right. So if you're interested in the book, you go to startfinishingbook.com. There's also startfinishingbook.com forward slash resources that has worksheets, tools. I'm a big fan of worksheets. And so my main website, Productive Flourishing, um, has a tab on free planners. And I think we currently have 12 to 15 that you can just download for free. No email address needed. Just get them, use them because I really want people to to be doing more work. We create worksheets and planners whose main job is to channel your creative energy and channel that, that, that energy into finished projects. And so people who want to finish more projects love them. Um, They come at a cost though, Serena. Mm -hmm. The cost is you're going to need to choose a fewer number of projects that you're going to finish. Yes. And let go of all of the someday, maybe later, wouldn't it be cool ideas right? um, that just are not going to make the cut in the end. This has been an amazing interview. I'm, I'm really hoping that people will watch this and feel like now they have an action plan. They know where to go to get more information. The book is amazing. And uh, yeah, can they find you online? Where can they find you on social media? Are you on social so, media? So- I am on social media. So um, my main social media that I hang out on is Twitter. I'm at Charlie Gilkey. Okay. Um, and if you really want to dive in, though, I think actually going to the website is the best place to start because there are so many resources there available for folks that I actually encourage people to check a few out um, and then ask a few questions and get involved. We've got a really active community. And so um, I would say that would be a great pathway. But if you just want to stop by and say hi, I'm on Twitter at Charlie Gilkey. We'll definitely be connecting. And I'll have all your links down below in the show notes and in the description so people can find you. But this has been great. So thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing what else you're doing next. 
Yeah, thanks, Serena. And, uh, you know, I'd be happy to come on next time, too. Definitely. All right. Thank you. So it looks like we all have some homework to do. We need to get those downloadable sheets, those printables, because they're going to help us do our projects. Now we know that creative constipation is a real thing. We have to create. And I think with this book and these worksheets, we're going to be able to get our projects done and not overload ourselves. Be sure to come back for episode three. We're talking with Kaveri Marate about five wasteful and toxic effects of buying new. Thank you for listening to the Thrift Diving Podcast. I will see you next episode.